one response you said is that for India to be more aggressive when it comes to bringing down its corporate tax rates, you believe yeah. this 25% is not going to work. No. Uh, yeah. Much more radical yeah. action needs mm -hmm. to happen and it needs to happen perhaps now. as soon now. as Budget Absolutely. 2017. Yes. What else? Well, I think that, you know, I mean, in terms of the fact that the other, uh, that's big. Then about, you know, you know, like, I think that our entire model of exporting our way to prosperity mm. is something under serious threat because I think that we're in a world of deglobalization. Yeah. And in this, to rely on external uh, capital much to fund our growth, because that's something which I think that the government spoke about, we just have to be mindful that, yes, that is how it used to work, but that model today is seriously impaired. So encourage domestic investments, yeah, which I, haven't picked up. Exactly. But I'm saying, but to expect much more FDI or foreign investment to flow into India, I'm not very hopeful of that okay. because because the world because we're in a deglobalizing world, which means that the trade flows are going to remain weak for a long period of time uh, across the world, and also capital flows are going to remain weak across the world. In that environment, you have to sort of focus much more on the domestic economy and exporting it to prosperity. That model, I think, has been seriously impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the development ladder from just being like this has basically gone yeah. uh, vertical. So it's going to be much harder to grow. And then I'd say, you know, like even in terms of bringing back black money and you know doing these these kind of things like need more capital i think that once again i wish we had sort of learned from our own experience in the past and what other countries are doing like indonesia mm -hmm. indonesia wanted to bring back black money so they decided to have a penalty rate of just four percent mm -hmm. right so they and they got 300 billion dollars right including the former uh, 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 president suharto you know one of the biggest sort of crony capitalists uh, 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 leaders. His son brought in $30 billion. So I think it depends what we want to achieve. We are a capital-starved economy. If we need more capital, it's getting more and more difficult in the global marketplace. How do you attract capital flows in this? It's best if you attract your own money back, which is, you know, in terms of uh, overseas money. But today, in terms of, like, the uh, message, is, like, in fact, is going to be, like, you speak to businessmen, is they're still figuring out how to keep a lot of their wealth overseas, uh, rather than, like, bringing it back. Now, Indonesia did the opposite. In fact, they've been criticized a lot. It's the other extreme. A 4% penalty rate, and you can bring back whatever money yeah. you want. Yeah. They did that under the scheme, and they got $300 billion. So that's like a, an abundance of riches. But see how the mechanism works. Because they got that much capital in, now they're being able to cut interest rates. The currency has stabilized, even though they have a much larger current account deficit as a share of GDP than India does. That's the argument that the government is presenting, even as far as this particular scheme is concerned. There is but now an income declaration scheme passed to... At 50% of those kind of rates, these things don't work globally. That's a global experience. I mean, now maybe in India, like it'll function, but I think that globally, I think at those uh, rates, you just don't get much traction. Okay. So Indonesia does it at 4%, you get massive money in. But then that has political problems. Sure. That, because, you know, like you don't have the narrative that, oh, how do we soak the rich yeah. and, and all that. So I think that this is what we need to do. So for me, that's the really important part, that these experiments are going on across the world. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. All we have to do is to basically... Uh, borrow. And this is this, uh, I mean, as far as, you know, like, even as far as Prime Minister Modi was concerned, when he first came to power in, two, in like, 2014 in May, I remember I wrote a, an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal back then uh, in the U.S. That, that this is India's Reagan-Volker moment. Yeah. Yes, I remember right? that. Right? I remember and, that. Yeah, exactly. And my optimism was that, that, like, he was speaking a lot about minimum government, maximum governance. governance yes. And you had someone like Raghuram Rajan along with it that, you know, that that this combination could be really great for India in terms of potentially what it could be. Yeah. I had some reservations about it, but potentially yeah. what it could be. So I think that that's what we were hoping. Um, and then even then after that, we kept wondering that which global leader will Modi be like? Will it be a Reagan Thatcher? Will it be like Deng Xiaoping, Lee Kuan Yew, etc.? These things like demonetization are not from their playbook. That's my point. But right. he's writing his own playbook is what he says. Yeah, that's fine. But I mean to say that uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think that my basic uh, difference is the fact that we don't need to write our own playbook out here. These global experiments are going on. We're at a basic level of economic development. We have to just follow the best practices of what other countries are doing, and then we can sort of move on. Now, there are some places where you can argue that, you know, things are really out of whack in India, uh, and we need to do something. And so the other thing which I've been, I've been speaking about the last couple of years is the, the scope of privatization. Banks. I really thought yeah. that you know, something bigger would happen as far as privatization is concerned because this is still an economy where the state is very large and very dysfunctional in many parts. The harassment that ordinary people face yeah. is, has a lot to do with the fact that the state is dysfunctional in India um, in the way that they interact with it. Now take this you know, case of banks. There is no other country in the yeah. world that I know where the public sector, the share of 
assets held by the public sector yeah. is as large as India. Mm -hmm. That in India, the share of assets in the banking system held by the public sector is close to 70%. There's no democratic nation in the world which does that. You know, that's the kind of stuff that North Korea, etc. have. Mm -hmm. So like, I mean, uh, the average for emerging markets is more like 30, 33%. Mm -hmm. So why aren't we bringing that down mm -hmm. in terms of what needs to be done? So I think in terms of what India can do for me, like the, the, the path is quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. But politically, I don't know what's going on anymore because I, because I don't know that, it, I mean, if you change the narrative now that this is all, you know, because if the average person is sort of reacting well to this, I have no yeah. idea what exactly is going on currently. But if the average person is saying, you know, like is getting the sort of real thrill that the mm -hmm. rich person is being socked and stuff like that, there may be good politics. But from an economic standpoint, I don't think that's going to, that's great for the nation. For mm -hmm. the nation, what we need currently, if, if we have to become globally competitive and to and to grow at the rates of 7%, which is so difficult to do yeah. in today's environment on a sustained basis at a time when the global economy is growing at barely 3%, mm. is that we need to basically uh, react to the international environment. We have to cut our corporate tax rates very sharply. Mm. We need to privatize our uh, bloated public sector. Yeah. Uh, and also, if you want to bring money back in, then how to incentivize people to come back into the, sure. in, take into the country. And that needs to be done with more carrot than stick. Okay. Which is that, you know, like more, more incentives rather than sort so of disincentives. So what does uh, this then mean, uh, Richard, the case that you've presented? What does it mean then in terms of capital allocation? I mean, where would India stack up then, for instance, as far as your emerging market fund is concerned, well, as we look ahead? Yeah, I think that as far as we are concerned, we have pulled back because I think that, you know, in terms of, I don't know how the next 12 to 18 months so is in it, this country is, is going to be pulled top out. three, top four in no, terms no, of destinations? No, no I think Not that, even the top five? Yeah, because I think that, you know, I mean, like the, there are other places where the recovery story is a bit better. Uh, like Eastern Europe, for example, we find a lot of opportunity because Europe's doing better, like it's doing well. In Southeast Asia, I'm quite impressed with the reforms that Indonesia is doing. Philippines, despite everything yeah. you know that, that the president says in public on politics, on the economic front, they're doing a relatively good job. And then like in Latin America, there's opportunity. And also, like as I said, I was in, in Mexico and the currency has never been this cheap in its history. Mm. You know, like the cheapest currency, like you... Uh, I stayed at the Four Seasons Hotel in, in like Mexico. I forgot to carry my socks there. I went to the boutique downstairs and I got the best pair of socks for $3, basically. So, yeah. you know, like it's super competitive yeah. in terms of uh, as far as Mexico is concerned. So I think that you're finding these kind of stuff. But in general, it's a, it, this is a difficult environment for emerging markets because the United States has decided to totally change the game. Yeah. And I think that the implications of that are being felt. So that's one of the reasons why we have had such a, over the last uh, five to six weeks, we have had such a strong rally in the United States and it's not been matched mm. by what's happening in uh, emerging markets. Emerging markets have barely, you know, have done nothing over this period, even as the United States has rallied very strongly. And I, I think the threat of protectionism is very real. Very real. But there are different ways it's going to come. It's not going to come in the classic way of more tariffs and, uh, and stuff. But these non-trade tariff barriers yeah. is yeah. how it's going to come. And changes in the tax regime are possibly going to be a very big deal now.